presentation this morning is entitled Implications of Different Forms of Critical Thinking, and our speaker is Neil Brown. Neil is a distinguished teaching professor of economics and law and a senior scholar at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. In addition to teaching courses in critical thinking and great ideas, he manages the admissions, mentoring, and programming needs of a learning community of 40 students whose interdisciplinary curriculum and research is anchored in critical thinking and ethical reasoning. In addition to having won numerous national, state, and local teaching awards, he has published research articles on a broad range of topics, from the role of markets in distorting values to rhetoric in the social sciences, the role of metaphors in shaping disciplinary perspectives, the implications of cross-cultural differences in attitudes toward individualism, pay equity, cognitive biases, and the pretend pretensions of expertise, the inappropriateness of the customer metaphor for students, and the conflict between student evaluations and the encouragement of an optimal learning environment. Among his more than 50 books and editions in developmental education, economics, business law, business ethics, and cognitive skills, he is most proud of Asking the Right Questions, a Guide to Critical Thinking, currently in its 10th edition. His presentation begins from the observation that college catalogs often tout the emphasis on critical thinking in their curriculum and classrooms, but many things termed critical thinking in one classroom are contradictory to the practices known as critical thinking in the classroom right next door. The aim of his talk is to encourage us to wrestle with such contradictions and complexities, and ultimately to suggest the desirability of experimenting with particular forms of critical thinking. Neil, are you ready to kick off the conference? I am. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. To teach critical thinking now is intimidating. Derek Bach, academically adrift. Those who look at the output of a college education are convinced and present some compelling evidence that very little critical thinking is learned in a university experience. I think most teachers hey, Yes. I'm sorry, would you be able to share your screen? Perfect. OK, thanks. Most teachers who teach in a university are probably shocked at that message. I think part of the reason that there is the shock is because professors feel as if they're teaching something that they would term critical thinking. But when measurements are made using a particular understanding of critical thinking, very little is found. And in fact, only the most optimistic of institutional researchers tend to find that much critical thinking occurs on a university campus. Let's talk about why and what we can do about it. College catalogs obligatorily contain a promise that critical thinking will be taught. A survey of faculty syllabi reveals that faculty know that they're supposed to teach something called critical thinking. Let's talk about how we can bridge the gap between what research findings suggest, little critical thinking, and what we aspire to, and that is a generous amount of productive critical thinking. How can we bridge that gap? I entitled my presentation Critical Thinking for Kind Learners for a reason. Part of the problem of critical thinking education is that when we, when we think about what it is, it's something that is off-putting. It's critical thinking. Uh, for example, in uh, Edward de Bono's Thinking Hats, he talks about a black hat as standing for critical thinking. Black is not a color of invitation. Black is not a color of encouragement the way he's using it anyway. And so what is he thinking about? Why is he saying a black hat stands for critical thinking? 
we see the term, and, and I have it in red for a reason. Thinking is frightening unto itself, but critical thinking, it has a particular odor about it. It has a particular aura about it. And it's not an aura that is pleasant or inviting. The very activity and, and way we think about critical thinking needs a massive PR campaign. Do I really want to be engaged in critical thinking? Any learner might well think. Critical thinking sounds argumentative. It sounds like a some kind of male domination motif. Um, it's threatening. It's arousing. It's angry. It's critical thinking. I don't know whether I want to be involved in that kind of thinking. Do nice people engage in that kind of thinking? You may have noticed, as I did, that two weeks ago, CNN restarted what was a horrible program from the point of view of a critical thinking teacher, and that is Crossfire. And the idea on Crossfire adds the idea on sports commentary programs increasingly is one person hollers with extensive gestures, then the next person says, something akin unto, do you have a brain, looks at the other person with amazement as if, how could you possibly say anything like that? And you can tell that the purpose of the participants is to act in that fashion. So each person is trying to win, trying to get the other one to holler, uncle, trying to get the other one to say, Mea culpa, you're so, so right. The people, the looks on the people's faces are faces of, I want you to go away. I want you to be somewhere other than in the, the human community. From a learning point of view, if I'm, if I'm a learner and I'm walking into something, I don't know what critical thinking is at all. And I hear that word, I'm afraid I think of machine gun. I don't think of flowers. Whether people are mean or not, they tend to think of themselves as kind, sharing, caring. Critical thinking seems to ask of learners, will you become something else? Will you become a tribune? Will you become a warrior? Will you become a person who is agitated and eager to tromp on the speaker, the writer, uh, eager to point out that they're flawed? mean people and critical thinking. It, it seems to go together. Uh, I'm, I'm writing an article right now about legal education and uh, Lanny Gurnier, uh, who you may, some of you may recall was a nominee of uh, Bill Clinton for Attorney General for a while until her writing became public information. And one of the things that Lanny Gurnier has done in legal education, one of the things that Women's Ways of Knowing hints at as well is, is trying to make the point that critical thinking is uncomfortable. Uh, critical thinking is stress-inducing. Uh, critical thinking is for mean people. Critical thinking also is judgmental. Uh, it's very few of us are eager to have other people make assessments of us. Uh, I don't know about the situation that any of you are in, of course, but I know at my university, uh, professors are very reluctant to have anyone come into their classroom, uh, very concerned about anyone evaluating her or him. Uh, 
evaluation is not something that we wake up in the morning and hope that we have a healthy dose of. So when we think of critical thinking and we know that as a result of critical thinking, people are going to be listening to us more closely. They are going to be deciding whether what we have said has a certain intellectual standard. And because of this dimension, this, this sound and smell and feel of critical thinking, we can understand a little bit about why Edward de Mono treats critical thinking as if it is something that only uh, mean, aggressive people would use. So there's two dimensions of the problem as I see it. And again, the problem is that we say we want to encourage critical thinking, and yet when assessment is done, we find that little critical thinking occurs. That's partly a definitional problem, but it's also partly a twofold problem. First, there is the problem of the delivery itself. That's dependent upon ourselves. And the second problem is the student brings to the class a certain perception of who he or she is, who humans are in general. Specifically, when, when, when we say critical thinking, the learner hears or thinks something. And the previous slides were suggesting that what he or she hears and thinks is not inviting. It's not something that a nice person would want to do. The learner brings to the situation a desire to fit in, to be nice, to be regarded by peers as somebody who says, have a nice day frequently, not could you clarify the assumptions that you made in that analysis of that essay? Could you clarify the ambiguity in the argument that you just made? Don't you think there's some missing information in the argument that you just made? Couldn't those same reasons be used to lead to a different conclusion? What can we do about the gap between what we would like to provide through critical thinking, its encouragement, understanding more about it, uh, feeling the empowerment that comes from critical thinking, doing so in a pluralistic fashion, and doing so in a fashion that can be justifiably regarded as an act of friendship, as something that is kind, growth-oriented, well-meaning. I have some suggestions. I want to share them with you right now. <clears throat> the, the first suggestion comes from an experience that I had when one of my students went to Japan to teach, and he taught critical thinking. And one of the, the first things that he noticed was that, uh, that he was a failure, that he was doing horribly that uh, his students were not responding, they didn't like what he was doing. He was so excited about teaching critical thinking, he, he, he was uh, a maven of critical thinking education, uh, thought that it was something that enabled human beings to see more broadly, to tolerate alternative perspectives much more, to go into depth where the absence of critical thinking often leads to superficiality. So here's this exciting piece. You're excited about what he's doing, and, and it's not working. So what, what he discovered quite by accident was that he stopped teaching critical thinking as something where one is trying to get others to behave better, and instead encouraged students to, to seek 
abilities and dispositions that would create an improved self, that would enable them to go in the direction of Aristotle's, the self I want to become. And so he reframed, and of course this has a happy ending, he reframed critical thinking as improved thinking, as, as thinking that uh, is developmental. It's not about spotting fallacies. It's not about recognizing that other people are being sloppy in their thinking, but it's about my being concerned about my own thinking and wanting to be able to look in the mirror, give myself the high sign indicating that before something gets in my head, I'm aware of certain filters that that something must pass, that is when I'm at my best, for it to get into my head as a conclusion that I want to at least provisionally hold. So my first suggestion is trying to reframe critical thinking in the minds of the students as not something that you're applying to other people, you will be, but rather as something that you're, you're applying to other people for the sole purpose of being helpful to yourself. The same reason that I might exercise or walk 10,000 steps each day is because I want to have a more vigorous personhood. Similarly, I want my thinking to be an improved form of thinking and critical thinking can help. Second suggestion. When critical thinking is taught in terms of giving students a set of observational or perhaps reading comprehension skills that one then applies to the thought of others, the natural response to that training is that when one hears a critical thinking problem, one issues a statement, one points out that there is, there is an improper analysis of that evidence. Uh, there's a reference to average data, but the average data is very different depending upon whether we have a mean, mode, or, or uh, a, um, uh, a median. So if I said to someone in the midst, let's say, of an academic seminar, but you fail to specify which average data you had in mind, that statement is much more threatening than if I were to say, I'm, I'm trying to understand what your point is, and I was curious because I, I missed it. Uh, what kind of average were you referencing? In other words, the tone of a question can be made to be much more inviting, reflecting much more curiosity rather than truculence. So my second suggestion is, is to structure critical thinking around the act of asking questions rather than making claims about the thinking of others. Third suggestion. Part of the reason why critical thinking is seen as mean is because Many people are walking around with the cognitive bias of an overestimation of personal acuity. That is, human beings have an exaggerated sense of what they're able to do. If I have an exaggerated sense of what I am able to do, then naturally when I play soccer and everybody gets a trophy, I think my trophy was well earned. Someone who plays soccer as well as I do should certainly receive a trophy. So I get this sense in my mind of my wonderment. I get a sense that I am incredibly efficacious. I'm incredibly skilled. And I bring that into a classroom. And now I'm being told that sometimes my thinking is not all that wonderful. And I don't like that. Because my self-concept is, um, and the Dunning-Kruger effect is uh, a great illustration of a research project that 
has been done to try to demonstrate that the less you know about something, the more confident you feel about it, in that you don't know the dimensions of the something naturally enough, it's easy for, for us to take our, our exaggerated self-assessment bias and then conclude that I must be a most wonderful chess player once I know what a pawn looks like. So there is a huge literature now, uh, especially a huge literature in the medical field, that, that points out that we are not who we think we are, but that we're very mistake-prone. That we, on a good day, make a few mistakes, but on a good day, we do not make no mistakes with the double negative intended. So by, by encouraging students to reframe who humans are, to accept our, the fragility of our thinking, by, by sharing with them that it is human to make mistakes, and in fact mistakes are a crucial avenue toward growth, that may at least have um, some effect on their willingness to be evaluated, to, to, to learn evaluation skills that can be applied, yes, to others, but also to themselves. In other words, it's okay to be a project that is in evolution, rather than to see oneself as a finished product that's quite wonderful. I've listed two books here that have this effect of, of talking to us a little bit about the importance of making mistakes and how frequently we make mistakes. Uh, here's a third one that I didn't include on the slide, uh, Madeline, and the last name is Van, V-A-N, Heck, H-E-C-K-E. And the name of the book is Blind Spots. Why Smart People Do Dumb Things. And I particularly like that subtitle because my students have this idea that dumb people do dumb things. And if we can share with them that smart people do dumb things, if we can share with them Danny Kahneman's comment toward the back of his thinking fast and slow where he says, you know, my whole life has been based on talking about these cognitive biases, and in no way can I avoid them, that they are part of who I am, too. These are human cognitive biases, not the cognitive biases of dumb people. A fourth suggestion. Whenever possible, try to encourage students to think about what it means not to have critical thinking. In other words, who are we if we do not have a set of standards that something must pass through before it becomes part of who I am, part of my belief system, part of my conclusions? So if you think about what we, how we would see somebody who has few to no critical thinking skills, the metaphors that we would use to describe that person are not pretty. They're not ones that one would want to put on the bed, uh, over the bed, as a an emblem of who you or I are. Uh, a puppet. Somebody's pulling our strings. We're not in control. Our autonomy is minimal. We're a puppet. That puppet on the screen right now can laugh, can cry, can sneer depending upon what somebody else does to the puppet. And that idea of loss of autonomy can be appealing to students as a negative frame for saying, oh my god, I do need critical thinking. Uh, we, we would refer to somebody who didn't have any critical thinking as a hard head, somebody for whom there's, there's a little porous possibility that we have uh, some kind of analysis or some kind of argument that could somehow make them an improved version of themselves. Uh, dogmatic, it's not a compliment. You just don't listen, that's not a compliment. And listening doesn't just mean I can replicate the words, but listening means 
can I parse the argument that the person made? What is the person trying to get me to believe? What avenues is he or she using to try to get me there? Finally, uh, and this is a suggestion that I think uh, asks us to be psychologically strong. I think that to, to give students a sense that critical thinking is not me, but that it's something that kind people do for themselves and for other people, it's very helpful to make the point that on a regular basis, you and I make mistakes. So what I like to do is I like to tell my students about all my failed thinking scenarios. Not all of them, let's hope, but at least some of the more dramatic ones. Uh, for example, when I chose the college that I went to, well, I don't want to tell you how I chose the college that I went to. It's embarrassing. I did not do any of the things that a critical thinker would do. Uh, quite the contrary. Some of you know the, the metaphor that uh, Professor Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, uses for the relationship between reason and emotion, where emotion is a raging elephant tearing through the neighborhood, and on the raging elephant's back is a little tiny person who's sweating and struggling, trying to halt the elephant. And uh, clearly, my elephant was in control with respect to my choice of college. My choice of a major when I was in college, disgusting, shameful, horribly sloppy thinking. I went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and I looked at the top job in terms of money earning and uh, um, I thought as a child of America that that's what one was supposed to do. Couldn't understand why everybody didn't want to become an actuary when I saw that data and became a math major. Oh my God, that's horrible thinking. I did that. Um, my choice of a doctor for my dehydrated child uh, when my three-year-old was dehydrated, um, almost died, um, life flight to a, a better medical center because I chose the quick doctor and not the good doctor. Uh, very, very embarrassing, on and on. One final bad decision I made. I thought this goat in Switzerland was really cute, and I went to uh, pet it, and I'll simply allow you to complete this story. Um, I, I was not very familiar with goats, and I found this one uh, like to be petted. But what I didn't know is, is that, because I don't know much about goats, I probably should have known more about goats, but as I stood up to leave, the goat was not happy about my leaving. And you see those, those protrusions coming out of its head. It applied those to me. And that wasn't good thinking. It was a mistake, and it, it's something that I try not to do on a regular basis, but each day I know I'm going to get up and I'm going to make mistakes. I don't want to wallow in them, but at the same time I accept my humanity as painful as it is, and if my students can accept theirs, then they're much more likely to see critical thinking as a growth inducement, as a supplement to their own personal growth rather than as something that is trying to demean them in any way. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, Neil, I'm I'm still recovering from the goat story, so I'm uh I'm, I'm, me, I'm not quick it, on posing the questions. <laughs> Never mind. It, it took me a while, also. <laughs> I can only imagine. Uh, we were we were wondering, um, Jean Pierre and and Megan and I um, were were all struck by the the idea of um, the student you had that was teaching in Japan and and kind of. Um, kind of got us wondering about um, sort of the, the cultural construction of this kind of resistance to critical thinking that um, that you're talking about and also um, whether you think that certain types not just cultural types but um, 
certain types of, of learners, say extroverts versus introverts, do you think there's a difference in how, um, how those different groups of students are um, perceiving or those different types of people perceive um, critical thinking? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, when um, I, I think a number of people who uh, listen to such presentations are well aware of women's ways of knowing. One mm -hmm. of the often three to five most influential books for a lot of people who consider themselves feminists. And one of the things that I really liked about the book, there were some things I didn't like, but there were a lot of things I did like. And one of the things I really liked about the book was that it was making the point that some people are very much more comfortable in a situation where the heat is increased in the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, some people, at the very sound of a strong voice, they retreat into a self that is hard to recapture. And, um, and, and there are learners. They're the only learners we have. And so we have to think about uh, what do we do on their behalf and how do we get them to feel differently. Mm -hmm. One, one of the, 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 the good things about teaching for as long as I have is, is that I've seen a tremendous growth in the risk-taking ability and the comfort with critical thinking among women. And, and I attribute that to a number of, of cultural changes. Uh, but I, I just wish uh, that people could come to my class. Some days I'm just overwhelmed by hearing women with strong, confident voices who are quite willing to recognize that they make mistakes and <clears throat> that are on a self-improvement path that um, heretofore I would have said the numbers were dramatically reduced in terms of, of women and shy men's willingness to even explore the possibility that anybody could make a mistake, mm -hmm. certainly not them. Uh, I, I can't I can't teach Chinese students uh, very well because, and this, this goes right to your point, um, when I show Chinese students a journal article by someone from Princeton and a journal article from somebody from Berkeley, and I say, what is your reaction? Which one did you think was most accurate? I've had multiple Chinese students start crying. And yeah. the reason is they say, I, I cannot, those are famous professors. Um, so anyone who has any kind of hierarchical orientation mm -hmm. and who has been taught that one does not question either elders or those who have some kind of uh, advanced training, then critical thinking instruct, instruction just you hit your head against a wall because mm -hmm. psychologically they're not willing to ask questions of authorities. They've been taught that it is impolite, that it mm -hmm. is improper. So. Um, could, could I share with you my experience with um, African-American students? My experience with African-American students is terrific. And, and it goes right to what you're asking about. Um, I do teaching demonstrations at universities sometimes. And, and I've been in situations where you know, I'm up on a stage and, and there's a class. And there are 200 skeptical professors watching me who are thinking, yeah, what can this guy do? And, and I know that. And when, when at, the only thing I, I um, hope for when I say, well, I'd like to do a teaching demonstration is I hope there's a lot, there are a lot of African Americans in the class. Why? Because in my experience, African American students are willing to take risks, be wrong, smile, and the next time a question is asked, their hand shoots up in the air. Now that may be because of my demeanor, it may be because of my the way I look, it may be because of the way I act, and maybe it's a maybe it's a dynamic. Maybe I just get get to do well with African American students. I don't know. But my experience is is that African American students have an incredibly positive learning attitude in terms of critical thinking instruction. 
you know, Neil, this is also reminding me of um, of a of a talk you gave um, at a conference maybe a year or so ago, where you talked about um, I think it was called A is for asking questions, and it was about kind of creating a classroom environment that invites um, that invites questions from students and is kind of a way of um, where the, the teaching methodology there is you're trying to retrain students to um, to sort of to engage differently and to to ask questions and I'm I'm just kind of struck in in listening to you today um, thinking about the way that creating um, and inviting persona or environment for asking questions um, is really foundational to uh, to creating a space for critical thinking and I, I wonder if you think that's a fair assessment absolutely and one of the things that makes critical thinking instruction so difficult is you you wouldn't have to take a very long field trip at most universities. Just walk down the hall, and and what do you see? Teacher talk. Um, you'd see it often in my classrooms. Uh, we have the microphone. Here are a group of people who are staring at us, at least acting as if they're paying attention to us. It's very flattering. My <laughs> wife is too intelligent to pay that much attention to me, and 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 and, and so. I think that the temptations are huge <clears throat> to when you see a student's hand go in the air. It's probably a signal that it's extemporizing time for you because you never know what they're going to ask. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of teachers get in the habit of thinking that they're supposed to cover certain material and every student hand up in the air is getting in the way of that material. And mm -hmm. in terms of what you were saying, Students who learn to ask a lot of questions, and I have all kinds of stratagems for getting them to do so. I, I am shamefacedly theatrical, and when <laughs> students start asking questions, um, I will often do stuff like I have little fireworks that I set off. I have, I have a, a, a clapper that I, I wave in the air every time. You know, because I, and I know it sounds like training penguins or something, but, but, but basically what I'm doing is I'm showing my excitement. I always tell them, like, mm -hmm. I'm not allowed legally to hug you, but, you know, here's a substitute. Like, I'm so happy that you're asking these questions because this is the avenue for me to make contact with you. Because if you don't ask the questions, then I just prattle on, and who knows what's going on in here when I'm talking, and you're confused or, or you're wishing you were elsewhere or something. So as soon as they ask questions, I'm like, okay, now that's a teaching moment. I don't know about my lectures. I don't know whether those are teaching moments or not. But I, I do know when they have a concern, that means they are there in the classroom. And, and that's especially exciting. But if you train them to ask questions and then they go to the next four, four classes and they stick their hand up in the air and the teacher ignores them, and that happens a, a lot. When that happens, um, what signal do they get? Well, you shouldn't ask questions. Mm -hmm. you, and, 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 you know, this is interesting, too. I think it's a cultural phenomenon. Um, you know, when I go to professorial conferences, um, I'm aghast at the number of professors who don't ask questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good point, and I I think too sometimes it it goes back to what you're saying earlier about you know that questioning like you know other enactments of critical thinking can sometimes seem like it's combative that we've we've sort of constructed it that way, and that if you you know there's that feeling that if you ask a question in a professional setting you'll either expose your ignorance or that you're, um, you're creating a, a combative situation for the, the speaker right. who may not know the answer. And it's this sort of general discomfort with not knowing. Um, you know, I, I, th I think that there's a, and um, you know, I have a law degree, and I noticed in legal education also, there's a need for some of the most simple level counseling skills that uh, people in social work, that nurses, uh, that certainly therapists of various kinds are given, uh, it's possible to ask a question in a non-threatening fashion. Mm -hmm. There's really no reason to exacerbate the tension of a question with a tone or with words that 
shout to the other person that they're a loser. Um, and, and counselors learn how those phrasings. They learn those tones. They learn, like right now, I, I'm, I'm kind of standing outside and watching myself. And right now, for example, Amy, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning over toward you. You know, I, I, I'm engaged with you. I, I want to hear what Amy's saying. And, and I'm, I'm gesturing wildly. There's nobody in the room, but I'm gesturing <laughs> wildly. And, and I have my hands open, and I'm gesturing toward you. It's inviting. It's like, come, come, Amy, let's talk. There are so many things that, that just basic counseling training would give people that would, that would enable them to ask questions in a fashion that would stimulate more questions, just as yeah. you know, the way we ask questions can easily extinguish questions for the next month. Yeah, and that, and that circles right back to where we started this Q&A with, with talking about um, cultural constructions, and, um, and you know, it, it sort of points to uh, maybe something we'll talk about in a future conference, the, the way in which um, our, our public arenas are, are filled with examples of <laughs> poor questioning strategies and, and combative, uh, conflict-oriented um, ways of, of engaging uh, with, with questions that sort of yeah. extinguish that um, sense of openness that maybe students um, would come to us with if they weren't you know, surrounded with these kind of examples of hostile questioning in, in public discourse. Right, and 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 part of it is not just our behavior, but it's also an understanding of humanity as being full of mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. Bill Gates always says, "I'm always afraid of a success because success is a horrible teacher. Mm -hmm. It teaches us that we don't need to learn more." And and right. and. The, the point that, that I draw from that is, is that we can frame mistakes, times when we're not successful, we can frame them as being on the road to somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, my mistake identifies a problem. I'm going to try to address the problem so that I'm, I am moving forward toward a goal that creates a self that I can be more proud of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great note to end on. Neil, it was such a pleasure to talk with you, as always. I'm going to, I might come up and uh, go to one of your classes when I'm uh, up in Ohio next, visiting my people, and I'll let you know so you can get the fireworks in there, because I'd really like to see that. <laughs> I'm always afraid, Amy. It's so funny, because I have these things, and I, and I picked them up at a, at a hobby store, and I'm, I'm so afraid that I'm going to set one off in my face, because... <laughs> I oh, don't no. really quite understand how all that confetti comes bubbling out of them, and I, I know I'm going to do this sometime, and it's going to be right in my face. And, you know. <laughs> just, just, just remind yourself to look away and maybe bring, know, some, bring some goggles just in case. Right, right, right. <laughs> Thank well, you my, so much. my students wouldn't think that was strange. They're, they're never quite sure what I'm going to do. So. It, it would give them something to talk about. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. They, ha they already have that. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Neil, and Absolutely. thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.